Sunny days sweeping the clouds away. Everyone loves Elmo. The little furry red monster with a high-pitched voice has become synonymous with Sesame Street, the beloved children's show that has been entertaining and educating young audiences since 1969. But Elmo wasn't always the star of the show. He didn't always have the same iconic high-pitched voice. The version we know wasn't even introduced until the 1980s. And while we're at it, does everyone love Elmo? Well, I don't. Because I think that Elmo has single-handedly ruined Sesame Street. Let me explain. <laughs> Why? Does it look stupid? No, I just don't. <laughs> this video is sponsored by FlexiSpot. I've had my standing desk from FlexiSpot for a couple months now, and I'm never going back to a regular sitting desk ever again. I feel better, I don't have the same back pain I once did, and I feel more productive. I loved my standing desk so much that I actually got another one. This time I got the E8 desk with the 47.5 by 25.5 bamboo top, and it still has all the bells and whistles that I love about FlexiSpot desks, like the four height settings, preset buttons, and the attached USB charger. I'm still blown away by how high these desks go. I'm 6'5", and I don't even put it to its max height. It's really easy to put together. I put both desks together myself, though you might want some help moving it around because they are sturdy, which is what you want from a standing desk. You don't want something flimsy. If you've been thinking about getting a standing desk, you really need to go check out FlexiSpot. Check the link in my description below. It'll take you to their website. You can check out everything they have to offer, and I guarantee you won't be disappointed. These desks are beautiful, well-made, and a great price for such a great product. So there are no more excuses. And with Black Friday and the holidays just around the corner, now's the time to treat yourself or treat a friend. Again, make sure you use the link in my description. That way you won't just get a great standing desk, but you'll help my channel at the same time. I'm sorry. I will get it. I Did you get it? Yeah, it looks. I love the. Oh! Oh! Hello there! Oh, you surprised me! Yes, I did not see you there! I, like millions of other kids, grew up watching Sesame Street. And of course, as a child, you enjoy it for certain reasons, like the songs and the characters Big Bird, Kermit, Grover, Bert and Ernie, Oscar the Grouch, and Cookie Monster. But now, as a parent with two children of my own, I've been re-watching the entire series from the beginning, and I'm able to enjoy Sesame Street for other reasons. The important reasons that made Sesame Street so radically progressive when it first premiered back in 1969, like the show's focus on the intersection of the civil rights movement and education. TV executive Joan Gans Cooney, who ran the children's television workshop, said, The people who control the system read, and the people who make it in the system read. And with the rise in the amount of television children were watching, Cooney thought that she could use TV to help children read and close the literacy gap for inner-city black children. There's a very intentional reason why the show's setting wasn't a fantasy castle or some suburban house with a white picket fence, but a city street. It was sending a message about the range of children it sought to welcome. The racially diverse cast of children and grown-ups communicated that this was an open and welcoming block where real humans lived, alongside some strange and colorful monsters. Having this diversity was monumental. This would have been the first time many inner-city children saw themselves reflected on television. But outside of race, Sesame Street also portrayed adults and children in wheelchairs, blind, deaf, and with Down syndrome. Portraying this diversity that was more reflective of the real world helped normalize inclusion. So while Sesame Street was educating children about letters, numbers, shapes, colors, emotions, cultures, and so much more, they were also modeling progressive social values for a new generation. A, B, C, D, E, F, T, C, O, G, M, S, T, O, the first 16 years are magical, full of so many heartfelt and iconic moments, but there's a major shift in the show once Elmo is introduced. 
and the ripple effects over the following years and decades have made the show so much worse. Let's break down Sesame Street into two parts, old and new, or maybe before Elmo and after Elmo, in order to see just how much Sesame Street has changed. E. Old Sesame Street episodes were a vibe. They were quiet, cool, and abstract. No one was in a hurry to go anywhere. Segments were drawn out. You could see a segment where a toy boat in a bath is compared to a tugboat. Or interpretive saxophone sounds made to the molding and creation of a saxophone. Claymation of letters and numbers, montages of animals walking around with the quiet voiceover narration of a child. The show felt more experimental and wild, while also educational. In its first season, Sesame Street welcomed its very first celebrity guest, James Earl Jones, who recited the alphabet slowly and methodically in a close-up without ever breaking eye contact. Y. Z. It took something simple and made it riveting. This can sound like a cliche when talking about children's programming, but older Sesame Street episodes really were something that adults could enjoy too. There was a better balance of adults to Muppets on the show, and that translated to the kind of audience that was watching. As a parent myself, I can't stand a majority of the junk that's out there for kids that only appeal to them with annoying characters, bright flashing colors, and loud sounds. Old Sesame Street definitely falls under the category of low stimulation shows that I enjoy showing my kids. Low stimulation shows don't use a lot of visual effects like dancing letters, swirling shapes, flashing colors. They also speak in normal voices and use a rich vocabulary with natural conversations and have a slower pace. Unlike obnoxious TV shows that talk down to kids and use high stimulation visuals designed to be addictive. Adults were able to enjoy the show too because there was a better balance between the main Sesame Street storyline through the episode and then the sketches and songs and animations sprinkled throughout. And it was in a lot of these sketches that the writers were able to put in humor and references aimed at adults, like Monster Peace Theater. And that's the story of Cyrano's the Bergerac. How it ended, nobody knows. You said knows! And Sherlock Hemlock. Sherlock Kimlock sees all. Hello! Huh? Oh, I didn't see you. There were a lot of sketches too that just consisted of adults doing more slapstick humor without a Muppet in sight. The adults had a lot of storylines to track too, like the romantic relationships between Maria and Luis, Bob and Linda, and Gordon and Susan. We watched them date, get married, give birth, or go through adoption. I always loved the scene where Maria fixes the typewriter and gives it to David for his birthday. You ever get that feeling that, you know, one particular day out of maybe one <laughs> once a year, really? very special day? No, that never happens to me. No. Mm. It's quiet. It's not played for laughs. It feels very honest and real. Another one of my favorite scenes is the opening to an episode from season five, it's a long one-take shot that's about four minutes long. It's a quiet slice of life moment with these characters bumping into each other. It highlights the essence of Sesame Street with adults, children, and Muppets living side by side. Not one is highlighted more than the other. Again, there's a balance. Hi. Welcome to just another quiet day on Sesame Street. <laughs> Not only was there a better balance, but there was a specific intended purpose to the adults and Muppets. The diverse cast of adults helped normalize other ethnicities that had largely only been given specific stereotyped roles up to that point in media. I don't remember ever reading for any kind of a positive character. The only roles that I could find were gang members or drug addicts. I had gotten a role on television that was the role of a Latino, Mexican-American, who was like a regular person. On Sesame Street, they were all able to be strong and safe role models to the children on set, but also the children watching at home. The adults were also the ones guiding the learning on the show. 
This makes sense since a number of the cast members came from educational backgrounds. They showed proper methods on how to educate children, but also how to handle behavioral issues, social issues, and other questions that kids have. Of course, a famous example of this comes from the episode Goodbye, Mr. Hooper, when Big Bird struggles to understand the death of another adult cast member, Mr. Hooper. Big Bird, when, when people die, they don't come back. Ever? No, never. And this was the intended purpose of Big Bird in these early seasons, too. Silly doors. That's Big Bird! Oh, he's in my... Ah, do, do, he's do, in do, do, sure do. he is. Hello, Big Bird. Oh, hi, Gordon. He started off as a dumb oaf, but quickly turned into a character that could represent the children at home. You know, I don't think I should be playing him as a goofy guy. He has so much more depth. He's a very complex character. His official age is six years old, and Big Bird portrayed a lot of the experiences, fears, and questions that six-year-olds have. We needed a peer for the audience, a character that was young enough to make the same mistakes and have the same problems that a four-year-old would have. Big Bird was able to communicate that unique perspective. We watched him go through life events like going to school, going to camp, going to the doctor, and learning about death, as I already mentioned. It makes sense that Big Bird was the connection to children because he was basically the only Muppet that would continually interact with the adults on Sesame Street, since he wasn't confined to a particular set, location, or the short segments in between the larger episode stories. Big Bird wasn't stuck behind a table. He was able to walk around. It's easier to connect to a creature that moves and acts and thinks like we do. It's why Big Bird singing at Jim Henson's funeral hit so much harder. It's not that easy being green. Carol Spinney's beautiful performance never breaks the illusion. And just for a few minutes, you forget that Big Bird is just a puppet with a man inside saying goodbye to his friend. Thank you, Kermit. Big Bird had a purpose, and the adults had a purpose. And that was made abundantly clear with the Snuffleupagus storyline. I'm Big Bird, who are you? Uh, oh, yes, yes, I am a Snuffleupagus. Snuffleupagus was introduced at the beginning of the third season. He became best friends with Big Bird, but there was a running joke for years that no one else could ever see him besides Big Bird. Big Bird. Uh -huh. yeah. He, he, he had this? big legs, right? Uh -huh, and he was about Where the is size it, of a Bird? truck. Was this the snuffle what? I don't see it. His very existence became ambiguous. He would shuffle off screen, just missing the adults. No one ever believed that Snuffleupagus actually existed. The adults would even gently tease Big Bird, telling him that Snuffleupagus does not exist. <sighs> they didn't believe me. Well, you saw him. You believe me, don't you? This ongoing storyline continued on for 14 years. But in the 1980s, an alarming issue started hitting the news. A 60-minute series on child abuse made the writers and producers think that it wasn't a good idea to continue a storyline where one of the main childlike characters wasn't believed by grown-ups. Executive producer Carol Lynn Parent said, The fear was that if we represented adults not believing what kids said, they might not be motivated to tell the truth. That caused us to rethink the storyline. Is something we've been doing for 14 years, that seemed innocent enough, now something that's become harmful? They felt it was important for children to feel that they could talk to adults and be believed. And so in the premiere of season 17, Snuffy is finally revealed to the adults. I told you all along that there was a Snuffleupagus, my best pal. He's not imaginary, but you never believed me. The show drove the point home when Bob says, From now on, we'll believe you whenever you tell us something. Yeah. And who was also there to experience this monumental moment in the series? Elmo, please! Oh, Elmo wants to... Elmo, you and I have already met. Uh, never mind. That's right, Elmo. But let's back up a little bit to see how Elmo got there. That's the letter L. Hmm. Muppets creator Jim Henson believed in letting a puppet grow and take shape organically. Each Muppet had a distinct personality, but it was the job of the puppeteer to uncover it. Puppeteers would slowly experiment with voices and personalities, however long it took, until something stuck. I mean, you can look at the first appearances of Big Bird, Grover, Oscar, and Snuffleupagus 
to see that some Muppets didn't show up fully formed. Now, now I'm not first, and, and I'm not last. Experimentation was the name of the game, but nothing ever seemed to stick for Elmo. Elmo first appeared on Sesame Street in the early 70s as an anything Muppet, a background character without any clear purpose or personality, I and mean, he wasn't even named Elmo at the time. Veteran puppeteer Richard Hunt tried to make something work with the puppet, attempting a raspy caveman approach that never worked. I am tall! That do matter much at all! As the story goes, Hunt threw the Muppet across the room, where it landed in the hands of Kevin Clash. Clash molded Elmo into a three-year-old who was cute, cheerful, and naive. It fit with his appearance as he already looked more cutesy than the average monster puppet. But the thing about three-year-olds is that they're all annoying and selfish. Trust me, I have a three-year-old. It's why Elmo always refers to himself in third person. He's very inwardly focused, like three-year-olds. While Elmo waits, Elmo will imagine Elmo already knows how to tap dance. Yeah, yeah. Okay, here Elmo goes. Whereas Big Bird was old enough to understand mature concepts and emotionally complex issues like death, sickness, and abandonment, and then could voice the same questions that children watching at home were undoubtedly having too. Elmo started having a bigger role in the episode where Snuffleupagus is revealed to the adults. Elmo was even made an integral part to it happening, as he kept Snuffleupagus from absentmindedly shuffling off, as he normally did before the adults could show up. Hold it! Wait! Oh! Snuffy! In the following years, Elmo slowly became a cultural phenomenon, appearing on talk shows and becoming the must-have toy for the holiday season in 1996 with Tickle Me Elmo. More storylines started revolving around Elmo, and by the late 90s, Sesame Street seemed like a completely different show. You got it! You got it too! Adults started having less storylines and skits, and all of a sudden, adults weren't the ones leading as much of the teaching. With Elmo as the prominent star front and center, it suddenly fell on his furry red shoulders to help educate. To capitalize on Elmo's popularity, Sesame Street started dedicating specific time to Elmo in a new segment called Elmo's World that lasted about 15 to 20 minutes near the end of Sesame Street, taking up about a third of the entire episode. Ooh, ooh, yeah, yeah. The state of Sesame Street today is pretty bleak and a far cry from what it used to be. In 2015, Sesame Street jumped from PBS to HBO, and with that move came some major changes. In 2015, Maria finally left the show. Oh, it can kiss. Oh, Maria. And in 2016, HBO fired Bob, Gordon, and Luis, three of the other original adults who remained on the show in a much smaller capacity. Sesame Street used to work because of its balance of Muppets with trusted adults that the audience could form relationships with. Now the only consistently recognizable adult is Alan, who's been on the show since 1998. Hiya, uh, this is Kermit Frog, here to talk to you about the letter K. And uh... When you watch the new episodes on HBO, there's a fake shine and gloss to it. A lot of Sesame Street has become lazy green screen backdrops which is diametrically opposed to the original purpose of Sesame Street. In the early seasons, Sesame Street felt like a quirky, dirty, and diverse New York City street. It was meant to highlight the beauty and community found in places that were once overlooked in media. Now, Sesame Street is a sparkling street more reminiscent of some Hallmark movie, devoid of dirt, grime, or anything real and authentic. The move to HBO also reduced the normal hour-long format to just 20 minutes. A reaction to what producers feared was shortened attention spans in today's children. But what makes me so incredibly angry is the fact that last year, HBO removed over 200 classic episodes of Sesame Street from its catalog just so they could save some money on licensing fees. That's where I got to rewatch and enjoy so many of these classic moments with my children. But now they only have a few episodes from seasons one, five, seven, and then nothing until season 39 through 52. The move to HBO has just been disastrous for so many reasons. Now, I don't want to completely discount everything about Modern Sesame Street. It's still a fine show for children to watch, 
and there have been some important and beautiful moments in recent seasons covering difficult topics like divorce, parents in prison, foster parents, homelessness, COVID-19, and autism. All right, no, hey, no, Ju no, Julia, Julia, no. let's take a break, okay? Break. In a recent interview, original puppeteer Frank Oz, who originally brought Bert, Grover, and Cookie Monster to life, said this about the current state of Sesame Street. Unfortunately, Sesame Street is only a shadow of what it was. They're just aiming it to little kids, and I'm unhappy about that. And that's my main point. Modern Sesame Street is regretfully fine. It's just a kid's show. But for a time, it used to be so much more than that. Sesame Street was brilliant, transcendent, a work of art, and the gold standard of children's entertainment. This episode is brought to you by the letters E, L, and K. Hey everyone, thanks so much for watching this video. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please like it and share it with a friend, and also leave me a comment below. If you love Sesame Street too, please tell me who your favorite Muppet is. And if your favorite's Elmo, maybe you can tell me why you love him so much. Why I should love him so much. If you're not already, make sure you're subscribed to the channel, but also click the bell below so that way you never miss a new video whenever it drops. Thanks again everyone for watching, and I will see you all in the next video.